Okay. Uh, thanks to everyone for coming and for hanging in there, given we're really nearing the end here, so I appreciate it. Today I'd like to talk to you about my new department at Yale University Library, which is called Computational Methods and Data, and it's brought together from existing parts of the library. Um, I am new to my role, so I've only been at Yale for four months, so the presentation may surface more questions than answers, but I'm, I'm really excited to tell you about this work. So today I'd like to um, structure the talk in three parts. Um, first to talk about the evolving needs uh, requiring a new approach. So researchers are coming to data and computation with diverse perspectives and needs um, and have uh, increasingly easy access to technology. Second, I'd like to highlight a key collaboration that we have with the uh, Yale Data Intensive Social Science Center uh, where we're working to host and manage uh, Yale Dataverse for research data management and sharing. And then the next steps, we're sort of lay out um, our work to define our scope and charge for the future. So I'd like to just start by saying I'm, I'm also new to libraries. So my background is in evolutionary biology and I got interested in data by working with, having to figure out how to work with large data sets in genomics. Um, and previous to Yale, I was at the Smithsonian Institution where I was a data scientist within the office of the Chief Information Officer. And our work focused on using computational tools like genomics and machine learning to analyze museum collections and archives data. Uh, we also provided a lot of support for researchers in their use of high performance computing and worked to define some best practices for using AI and museum collections data, work that is, will never be finished, but um, we got started on that work. So I'd like to first um, talk a little bit about sort of two researcher profiles that I like to keep front of mind when thinking about how we design services. And the first story will be about a researcher I worked closely with before she passed away at the Smithsonian Institution. Uh, Vicki Funk was a research botanist. She um, had a huge impact on collections at the National Museum of Natural History, collected 269 families, mostly plants, and it's a incredible number of plants. Um, uh, more than 11,000 specimens collected from 36 countries, many identified, uh, you know, many, many publications. She had more than 300 publications of her own, but um, these data are from bionomia.net, which, bionomia which is a great tool for looking at um, collections data and attributing specimens to collectors. Um, but I like to think about Vicki and sort of knowing her well and the work that she did at, throughout her career so much changed with, um, with data and what researchers were expected to do uh, when they gather and analyze data. So a single plant specimen can produce a huge diversity of data. Um, you have obviously the physical plant itself pressed on a piece of paper. Um, right now, the Smithsonian um, National Museum of Natural History has digitized the, almost all of the herbarium. I think around five million specimens have images and metadata. Um, so you can have an image, you have the metadata, you could potentially have observations or other data uh, as part of a you know, CSV file or some other kind of text file. Um, you could have field notes about the specimen, DNA sequences, and you could have potentially letters or correspondence from um, scientists. And this is sort of over, the last few hundred years for which we have specimens, again, five million specimens, just think about all the different places the data could be. And today, the data may be stored in many different places and analyzed with many different tools. So you could potentially do a GIS project looking at um, distribution data of plants. You could build phylogenetic trees from the DNA sequences, um, build a machine learning model to identify plants and you know, discover things about shape. For one researcher, this is a lot. Um, there's potentially uh, dozens of platforms or places where the data will go. You could analyze your data on a high-performance computing cluster or in our studio. You need command line experience. You put your occurrence data in GBIF, your code in GitHub, your um, sort of the uh, DNA sequence alignments in Figshare, your figures. I mean, it's just sort of endless, the kinds of things that we expect from researchers. 
And the common sentiment is sort of, I can't keep up with everything I have to do with my data. I'm really trying to do, do good science. I'm, I'm trying to be responsible with research data management, but it's, it's not easy, even if we have a lot of support for it. But then there's this other perspective. So a lot of researchers will readily engage with these topics, but many may not see themselves in the terms data, data science, or research data, or computation. So um, when I saw the job announcement come out for this position that I'm in, I thought computational methods data makes complete sense to me. But I think for a lot of people, it's kind of a, an othering name. And so this is something that we're really thinking about. Um, and many students in the humanities in particular will say, I don't think I have data, but they may come with questions about how to organize their work. Um, recently, I had the opportunity to talk to the Student Library Advisory Committee, which is a group of graduate students and undergraduates who advise uh, our university librarian on things about the library and what we're doing to fill their needs or not. Um, and more than one brought up this a kind of a classic data management problem, but sort of from the other, from a very different perspective than I would have thought about it. So one said that they, this was a PhD candidate in, I think in history, um, who said, I often go to the Beinecke, which is our special collections uh, library and uh, museum, um, and I look at documents if they're not digitized, I photograph them because I don't have time to read them all while I'm there. And then I make notes on them. And so I, he said, I have this problem where I have the images and I have information about the images and it's really hard to keep track of it. And you know what, what these students were describing is just as complicated a problem as the biomedical researchers face with their data. It may not be, the files may not be as large. Um, but when they're not already part of a collections database, um, they're sort of digitizing their own materials and trying to keep track of them for their work. Um, it's, it's really all the same problem. And so this is just something that we're thinking about how we approach meeting um, all of our uh, users. So I, I think also it's important to note, as, as you all know, I feel like kind of stating the obvious to this crowd, but um, the library sees researchers at every part of the research data life cycle. We may say we're not um, as much in the process and analyzing part of it, but we are connecting researchers to the resources they need to do that work. So I think we can't really take ourselves out of that. Um, this is from the NIST research data framework, which has um, been really helpful, I think. This is just sort of a um, an example of sort of how it can be really complicated for a researcher who's trying to think about where to store their data. I find this actually to be a very useful tool, so I'm not highlighting it in a way to um, say that it doesn't work. This is our storage finder at Yale. Um, Yale is a very big institution, um, obviously very distributed. There's a lot of research money from big grants, NIH grants, NSF grants. Um, a lot of biomedical research. So there's a lot of data storage on campus. There are a lot of options. Um, and if you come to this website, sort of new to data, it's very difficult to figure out where to start. And it's not the fault of the people who put this website together. I think it's actually quite comprehensive and good, but um, there's just always things changing and understanding the differences between these vendors. You know, Google Drive, <laughs> um, is kind of cramping down on how much people can put in there. I mean, of course, they underestimated what researchers will, will do. And, uh, you know, of course, people fill it up. I mean, no, no fault to them. Um, but just sort of helping, thinking about how, uh, sort of the way we present this information and how to help uh, get researchers to navigate to the kind of storage they might need for their projects um, is really challenging, given that everything that's out there, you sort of really need to be in the weeds to know what you need for your data. So our current team is quite small but mighty. Um, we have staff who um, do data and statistical support services, geospatial support services, and our digital humanities lab. I'll talk more about you know, the kind of services we provide. 
So our current um, services that are patron-facing are uh, research consultations. So anyone can book time with our staff and, uh, and more than a dozen graduate student consultants that we um, have um, to, you know, at any part of the research pro process to talk about geospatial methods, statistics, and digital humanities. So it could be project design, or it could be um, help with an analysis. In particular, it's the STAT Lab, which is what we call our group of um, statistical consultants, is available um, you know, for booking 40 hours a week for any kind of question, you know, troubleshooting our code to what kind of software should I use. We also provide um, some access to hardware and software and digital wayfinding to resources across campus. Again, there are you know, lots of different um, places at Yale to get access to hardware and software, and so we really try to focus on um, for geospatial and statistical um, and DH. But we connect people to the other uh, parts when needed. And community building, so this uh, photo just shows a number of the events that have recently um, happened within our, our team. So for instruction, um, it's a combination of um, you know, working with faculty to deliver content within formal courses, but also uh, I would say more predominantly workshop design and we try to reflect the kinds of questions we're getting in terms of what workshops uh, to put together. We're also available to collaborate on projects and I'll talk more about that, um, thinking about the future and how we do that work. And I really think, um, you know, our, our staff has a real bird's eye view of the kind of work that's going on across campus, so across departments, um, that we can really help um, researchers make the connections they need and, and navigate inefficiencies, and we'd really just like to improve this work um, as we go forward. Sort of on the back end are the things that patrons don't really necessarily see us doing. Um, there's a lot of work done in acquiring data sets, uh, mostly in the social sciences, giving them access to the data, keeping track of user agreements, um, that's uh, actually quite a time-consuming uh, process. We also uh, work with Library IT to ensure availability to um, software packages. You know, when do we need to update R on the public computers? This may seem like a simple thing, but um, when people need access to R, they would like it to be a current version. Um, and I, I see an even increasing um, important role in sort of bringing researcher needs to the attention of Library IT, Central Yale IT, and the Center for Research Computing. Um, particularly with research computing, which I'll talk about in a moment, um, their user base is broad, but really focused um, just because of the volume of data intensive research that incur occurs with biomedical researchers and physicists, for example. Um, making sure that we sort of center other kinds of user needs um, when they're thinking about um, decision making for hardware and software support. So some of the current challenges, um, you know, the collaborative projects are really exciting but can lead to kind of needing to maintain things for a very long time. And so that's just going forward, thinking about how to best um, continue to cultivate these collaborations across campus without having to be sort of be the IT for people when we're, that's um, not even library IT could take that on, it's just too much. Um, as we've heard a lot about here at this conference, there's increasing access to AI tools, but not necessarily the AI literacy needed to navigate how to use them in, in research. And staffing, um, we obviously um, need more staff. Um, both in library IT and user-facing um, to keep up with the needs and anticipate. So I'd like to highlight this collaboration we have with the Data Intensive Social Science Center at Yale that um, started about a year ago. Uh, DISC works with um, departments in the social sciences um, and we're, we have stood up uh, along with library IT um, an instance of Dataverse 
You may have heard of Dataverse. It's an open source project. It's a data repository to share, preserve, and cite research data. And I'd like to particularly mention Lamore Pierre, who's with the Institute for Social and Policy Studies, um, who has, is playing a central role in this work. Why do we need this repository? Again, this may be quite self-evident to everyone here, but um, we spend a lot of money on data sets, even at a very simple level, um, and researchers can't always find them or may purchase them twice. Um, the library catalog is not sufficiently flexible for the kinds of metadata that we need for data sets. Who can use the data? You know, what kind of compute you can connect to them? Like, there's just not a way to put that in the catalog. Um, Discipline-specific repositories, while wonderful, are not available to all researchers, depending on your, your discipline or the organism you're working on, if you're a biologist. And there's often gaps in what types of data they accept. So they may accept a finished product or raw data, but not necessarily all the in-between stuff. And so people still need a place that's more generic. Um, again, as you all know, data generated by researchers are at risk of being lost. Maybe they're on a hard drive under a desk. Um, or rendered pretty useless without metadata attached to them. Um, and data sets are increasingly large, meaning it's difficult to move them around. Um, you could walk with a hard drive to someone's office, but even um, you know, a, a standard hard drive you can buy for yourself might not be large enough. Um, researchers need to connect compute to data without having to download data to their local devices. I think this is a really important one that hasn't fully uh, been solved yet, but we're thinking about how we can best provide this access. So currently, we're in this proof of concept phase. We have a production dataverse where we have a handful of faculty curators and social science departments that are depositing data sets and working out the bugs, making a recommendation for changes, custom metadata fields that they need, and additional features. And it's limited right now to data that are public with a CC0 license. This is just an example of what a data set looks like in Dataverse. You have metrics. Um, I think it's a, it's a reasonable looking interface. Um, so the next phase, which we'll enter into in May, where we'll more broadly recruit um, users across social science departments. We're at least aiming for at least 10 additional faculty in this next phase, and we'll continue to focus on public data. But sort of in the back end during this time, uh, we'll be exploring additional functionality, and I'll uh, describe what that is in just a moment. And then phase two, where we open to the um, entire Yale research community we're aiming for, for the fall. So the additional needs that we're thinking about um, that, as we know, some data, particularly data that we purchase, are restricted access. Um, or data that scientists are generating may be temporarily restricted access um, or permanently. Uh, we need to think about how to provide that access, um, whether it's in Dataverse or by using an additional technology, potentially Globus. Some biomedical data need to comply with HIPAA regulations, um, but we may want to host that data. Some data can't be downloaded um, because the use agreement states that um, downloads aren't allowed, or it's, you know, five terabytes, and most people really can't download that to any device they're connected to. Um, but some of these data, you sort of want to click a button and have that data be imported to the high-performance computing cluster or to a data lake. Um, so we're looking at how to allow that, and probably also with Globus. And if you're not familiar with Globus, it is a a file transfer service where you can connect your storage as an endpoint and provides really a lot of the features that, that we'll need to do this well. I think a lot of the limitations with data repositories can often be around sort of not being a great place to put large data sets, but Globus would help us solve that problem um, because we can have the endpoints that allow fast transfer of large data. We also need to be able to remove licensed data. Um, and that's something, again, sort of once you publish something, it's not um, the sort of um, natural state of uh, to, to unpublish it. But that's, that's functionality that, that we need. So that's our Dataverse DISC collaboration. Um, but I'd like to talk now sort of about the next steps as we continue to define services for our team. Um, we're launching a collaboration with the Yale Center for Geospatial Solutions, which is brand new. Um, 
And uh, once that begins, we will have library staff embedded in that center and um, hire a new geospatial scientist to just increase the support we provide for um, geospatial. We'd also, as, as I sort of highlighted early on, we want to work on developing resource for, resources for patrons for whom the term data doesn't resonate. So whether that's making sure the library web presence is such that um, you don't need to use the word data to find the data support, what, what terms can we use to help people find the, uh, the support they need? We are working to develop new workshops specifically for undergrads and early graduate students on you know, how to organize your research or think about other ways to um, approach um, how we would define a um, workshop that's really about data management, but maybe um, is more, they can sort of see themselves more immediately. In, um, and there's a lot of courses that um, at Yale that use the Beinecke to study special collections. So we're going to work with them to uh, make sure that we, we sort of know what courses are coming through and, and offer to provide a, you know, part of that uh, module or you know, a workshop, uh, if it's not within the actual course, that has some data-focused uh, content. And I think part of it is also, you know, the, how we talk about our work. So try to document use cases that are not um, always from the traditionally data-intensive disciplines. So how can we make sure we're highlighting work done across campus that aren't sort of the usual suspects? As I mentioned with collaboration, we are currently really thinking hard about the best balance for staff collaborating on custom software with the challenges that come with hosting digital projects long term. Um, and so we are hoping to work more closely with library IT to document the most sustainable ways for researchers to go about these projects and to work to identify you know, common things people are asking for. Da dashboards is a big one. Web hosting for custom you know, digital um, resources and really documenting pathways to finding the right resources on campus if it's not through our team. And um, normalize and encourage planning in advance in, in every aspect of this. I think um, we want to hear about projects as early as possible. Um, some things about AI that are coming up. Um, you know, we're purchasing data the data use agreements are increasingly restrictive about what people can do with the data. How, do, how, how does that implement that policy? How much does it fall onto us to make sure people are um, adhering to it? I don't have an answer to that question. Um, and how we can uh, make sure that um, we, what role do we play in the equitable access to compute? So um, as I alluded to, the Yale Center for Research Computing operates on a PI model um, that many of our, our users don't, don't necessarily fit easily into, and definitely users in the humanities. Um, and many users may need more of a mid-size interactive computing environment where the YCRC may be providing, it may potentially be overkill for their work, or maybe not, um, but navigating that question I think can be difficult for researchers. And then thinking about what kind of instruction from our team is most impactful. So. Um, you know, there's a million places you could learn R. Is that really where we're adding the most value? I would say definitely not. So, but where are our, our students and, and, and researchers learning how to design a research project that uses data? So maybe that's a place that we can really focus our energy on. And where are the gaps in the formal courses? And finally, how we can provide training and professional skills that are applicable to students across the board that they're not getting in their coursework. So um, research data governance and storage are hot topics. I mean, I know it's not, <laughs> it's exciting to me, but I, I know most people maybe don't find them that interesting. But um, how, you know, that's sort of a, it's, it's everyone's problem and it's not no one's problem. I think people tried for a while to maybe you know, avoid it. Um, but how can we partner with central IT to really tackle these um, questions? And how can we make sure the work we do um, serves the broader community? Yale is a very resource um, rich and privileged um, institution. 
So thinking about um, ways that we might um, be more be intentional about sharing um, what we learn and the work that we do with, with everyone, the broader community. So we're exploring the possibility of internship programs for first-gen college students, partnerships with smaller institutions, really making sure that the resources, instructional materials, and documentation are shared with everyone, and just promoting open access data across Yale and making sure people are making their data public and describing it, um, which will make it more available to the world. So I'd like to thank you. We hope to have some new jobs advertised soon, and please um, reach out if you're interested in chatting. Thanks. Happy to take questions. Peter. Uh, thanks so much, Rebecca. For full disclosure, I used to work at Yale, and I'm really excited <laughs> to see that they've got you there uh, doing this great work. And I know one of the things we've talked about before is this whole, and that I also feel in my current institution at Stanford, is this tension between um, disciplinary expertise and employees who sometimes even pursued graduate study in a discipline versus this world we're in where so many techniques are horizontal, whether that's um, us borrowing sequence alignment techniques from genomics in order to find textual reuse, or whether we're using AI models to do all sorts of things in all sorts of domains. So I was just curious about, you know, there's great opportunities for libraries to be vertically um, excellent, and there's great opportunities for libraries to be horizontally excellent. Just sort of curious about your thoughts about that. Yeah, I think it's a really important question because and I don't know that there's an easy answer to it. So I'm trying to find the balance of a little bit of both, where we sort of want to honor people's discipline-specific expertise, which can really matter in how they relate to um, our users, but also with the understanding that a lot of the methods that we use are really are across the board the same. It sort of doesn't matter its data. But I know when people say that, it can really alienate people. So I think just finding that balance of um, yeah, I would, I would love as we grow our staff to just have people from many different um, disciplines and find a way that they can sort of highlight that expertise but come together around the, the commonalities, which is maybe uh, a little too optimistic, but I, I, think, it's, I think it'll work. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, how are you thinking about uh, handling indigenous data and in the work that you're doing? Yeah, so I haven't approached that yet, um, but I think it's a really important point. I, I know that we have um, a number of groups in the library working on um, reparative metadata, and I haven't yet um, engaged with them um, sufficiently, but I think that's something we definitely want to keep in mind. Uh, you know, ethics is a lens, I think, that we want to look at every um, all of the work that we do and all of the collaborations we take on. So thinking very carefully about um, how we're treating different data and how they were collected, I think is really important to consider. Well, thanks again.